Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Tim Rambles on About Wine. Uh, today, we want to talk about oxygen management. Um, in this particular case, we're going to talk about our white wines. So your wines for this are going to be four of them. So uh, get out four glasses, uh, open up your bottles of uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay, and then uh, your uh, little sample vials of the N and the O, and those are both Sagemore Riesling. Uh, if you can hold off on those if you want for a little while, and if you wanted to just use two glasses, that'd be fine. Uh, and just start with Sauvignon Blanc Chardonnay and then um, take a little break, pause the video, and come back in with the uh, Riesling because it's going to be a totally different uh, idea when we talk about flotation. Talk about oxygen management in white wine. Uh, it's your friend during pressing for non aromatic white wines. Uh, you can use oxygen to reduce some phenolic compounds. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. How much does that really work? Um, and then during fermentation, uh, using oxygen is a really, really good uh, thing to help your fermentations along. Uh, one thing I always want to point out is if you are doing some barrel fermented Chardonnay where you're you know, all three quarters full on the barrels uh, while you're fermenting, uh, make sure to do that final rack when you've got a little bit of sugar uh, activity left because then the yeast will suck up any oxygen you're having during racking. You don't have to worry about inert gas or anything like that. Um, where it's a problem, it's a foe at any stage for aromatic whites. Uh, it can really whack aromatics on the head. Um, and it's always a problem post-fermentation. After you're done with primary, um, you know, it's really, really important, even if you're undergoing mallow, to keep oxygen to a bare minimum. Uh, white wines oxidize and they fall apart really, really quick. So even if you're doing mallow, make sure you've got those barrels topped all the way up, really close to the bung during mallow, um, because there's not enough CO2 being produced to protect that wine from being oxidized. And then again, any time after that, filtering and bottling, we're going to do a whole uh, unit just on bottling alone. So I want to talk a little bit about reductive processing. You guys are all familiar with this. You've all seen this. Uh, and this is the idea of just minimizing oxygen at every turn. So how do you do it? Um, the best thing to do is to use a closed membrane press like we have, um, preferably one with oxygen exchange of some kind. They do make them uh, where you can uh, have an inert bag on the other side that is basically a big balloon that blows uh, nitrogen in and out. We just do it by dumping in bunches of carbon dioxide while it's happening. Um, and then uh, sometimes you want to do it all the way at the crusher while, while you're crushing. And if you do happen to machine harvest, um, a lot of people will add ascorbic acid and SO2 in the vineyard to uh, go ahead and keep those things from happening, uh, the oxidation from happening on the transport to the winery. Because once you're machine harvesting, those berries are getting broken. So uh, really frequently we'll see people add ascorbic because that's also a great antioxidant and is a great reducing agent. Um, so uh, these are the things we use primarily carbon dioxide at the crusher uh, press and tank and then a little bit of SO2 all the way along the way. Generally we add about 50 parts on the front end uh, during processing and then during pressing we'll have another 50 part add that we'll add uh, incrementally between the press cycles. We're going to do five press cycles uh, add about 10 parts between each press cycle and that'll keep that juice fluorescent green and keep that polyphenol oxidase completely inhibited and that juice won't brown. So our idea here is to end up with nice fluorescent green juice. Uh, we're going to be doing that by adding SO2 uh, at the crusher, maybe even ascorbic, um, and then got, you know, some good gas right at the top so that the second we're getting those berries burst, um, they're, they're immediately protected from oxygen to keep that uh, uh, enzyme uh, polyphenol oxidase from taking hold. And here's a nice little gif of what you should see when you do this absolutely properly. You've got this beautiful fluorescent green juice pouring out of the press from beginning to the end of the press cycle. You never get any of that browning. So let's talk about advantages and disadvantages and some problem solving in this particular uh, arena. So the upside is it retains aromatics in certain varieties, ones that have oxidizable aromas and pretty much the only ones this comes down to are things with lots of thiols. Uh, so Sauvignon Blanc and you know, Pinot Gris are probably the, the whipping uh, boys for this. Um, Riesling has some oxidizable aromatics to a smaller degree, but things like Chardonnay um, and uh, maybe even Muscat to a degree have very few uh, oxidizable aromas. Most of the terpenes that are in Debritz Terminer and things like that are, are pretty stable compounds. So they're not going to uh, oxidize particularly easily. So consider your variety. Um, and then the other times it keeps the, the juice, you know, really clear and green. So if you're looking for a really vibrant uh, colored wine, 
uh, that can can be helpful in that in that sort of just almost fluorescent clear um, look. And take a look at that 2019 Sauvignon Blanc in the bottle, and you can just see how absolutely crystalline it is. Um, and the other side of this too is that you're uh, using uh, CO2 and you're adding a bunch of SO2, so you're minimizing a lot of aerobic bacteria and yeast that might be coming in. So native uh, you know flora coming in from the vineyard. The downside is, is because there's no oxygen in the juice, it's a more difficult environment to ferment. And a lot of these wines were taking to really highly clarified states uh, in order to get rid of any lazy, mouthfeely characteristics. We're just kind of going for laser focused aromas. So highly clarified juice can, can do that. That's harder to ferment anyway. And then you go ahead and compound the fact that there's no oxygen in the juice for the yeast to get started on. So you're gonna need more uh, nitrogen in these wines um, at the beginning, middle and end. Uh, to avoid uh, reduction. Um, the other side is, is because you're crushing the grapes more aggressively, you're uh, adding more SO2, these things all lead to increased uh, tannins and phenolics. Um, and so you can end up with a, a really grippy wine. Um, so there's some real advantages to using flotation, um, you know, when using reduction, reductive style processing. And I'm going to talk about that when we get into flotation here in a little bit. Um, and then the other side of this too, is you're using a bunch of SO2 and CO2. That's a really big deal. Um, you're, you know, if you're trying to be minimal interventionist, you're trying to, you know, use minimal amount of product, you know, minimal handling, um, you're using more chemical. And so whether it's ascorbic acid, SO2, um, you know, CO2, you're adding additional, you know, costs and in, you know, uh, um, interventions into the wine's life. And lastly, the thing is, is that when you do reductive style bottling, you have a very limited shelf life on these wines. These wines get really tinny and tin canned, uh, canned corn when they're, you know, three, four, five years old. Um, so this is not for an ageable style of wine. This is for quick to market, quick to consume, where we're trying to retain as much of those fresh, fruity, you know, thial based passion fruit guava aromas in a Sauvignon Blanc. But if you have a bottle of our Sauvignon Blanc three or four years down the road, um, it's not going to be nearly as enjoyable. So go ahead and uh, taste this. Uh, here's our 2019 Sal Blanc. This is an, a perfect example of reductive processing. We clarified this to a point where we actually used uh, turbidity, uh, which we've talked about, where we were clarifying and doing the flotation until we got the wine perfectly clear to a level that we wanted. Sometimes when we uh, do heavy pectinase enzyme uh, settling, we can get as low as like four or five NTU, which is really, really brilliantly clear juice. And because of that, it's too clear. It's really hard to ferment. So sometimes you can over clarify juice. So we tried to clarify this one just to uh, a point where we had just the right amount of solids. So it would give it a more positive environment for fermentation. Uh, QA23 yeast, uh, which is our stock standard, uh, you know, house yeast, and uh, stainless steel fermentation took about 27 days and we fermented it low, slow, and cool. Um, and here's the final chemistry on it. And what you're looking at is uh, a pretty much dialed in spot on uh, wine. Uh, the reason we're not particularly worried about our molecular sulfur dioxide being 0.8 is this is sterile filtered. We don't need an antimicrobial at this point in time. So uh, really popped it. Uh, we definitely had to work on this at the end. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc group will note that we had to come in and do a little deacidification because we had too much acid. Then we came back with a, just a touch of residual sugar. I think we're sitting on about three grams a liter, uh, so 0.3%, and uh, really engineered this wine. So this is what I would call a highly engineered, highly designed, really probably, not probably, this is the best Sauvignon Blanc we have ever pumped out of college sellers. I think it's just gorgeously aromatic. The mouthfeel is really slick. And I think it was putting all of the years of understanding of reductive processing, then now how to use flotation, and then, you know, uh, all the pieces of the puzzle to be able to get this wine in bottle. So combination of reductive processing and flotation is what has really brought this together. And then, of course, coming in at the end with just that touch of sugar and, uh, you know, taking the acid down a little bit to, to bring the wine into balance. But yeah, definitely uh, not a low intervention wine. All right, let's flip the script. Oxidative processing. This is old school. This is how we've done it forever. Uh, whether it be in a basket press or just uh, our Wilms press, uh, it is as straightforward as it gets. Yeah, throw the grapes in the press and yeah, press them. So the theory is it's old school. 
just simply press the grades out using any major additives. Uh, and the idea is we want to oxidize any problems up front. We want to get rid of any potential uh, things that might lead to reduction later on. We're trying to get rid of any really fruit-driven aromas that might come from the fruit. And again, in terms of Chardonnay, there really aren't any. So uh, you're not really losing anything. And the other idea here is, is that you're going to get some flavonoids in the process of this, things that have a flavor, uh, you know, tannins that have a flavor. Um, you're going to minimize that because you've got minimal handling of the grapes. The, the stems are involved, which seems counterintuitive, but the stems really lead to um, uh, a nice juice channeling. So we get really clean, easy press. Um, and so that means the wines have to be pressed less hard. They dejuice easier. And um, you're going to end up with not only less tannin because of the easier pressing, but then the oxidation part will also help to reduce some of those, those phenolic components in the wine. And here's a picture of uh, from going back all the way to 1998, where they measured flavonoids and basically how many uh, milligrams liter of oxygen delivered over a period of time and uh, how much they reduced. So uh, from quite a bit to not quite a bit. So we've had a reduction in, in you know, some of those more aggressive, uh, you know, catechins and even tannins in the wine. So here's some hyperoxidation in action. So this was um, where we took some Chardonnay juice. And then what we did is we started oxygenating it and uh, causing it to brown. So this was the juice out of the press right after we pressed it. Uh, this was after we added oxygen for a little while, it starts to brown a little bit more. And then uh, this was finally when it started to look a little closer to, you know, tea or wheat coffee. And this is those tannins literally showing up, they're aggregating, turning brown, and then eventually they get big enough and fall out of solution. And the idea with hyperoxidation is you're going to oxidize all these phenolics and then they're going to, to leave the, to aggregate and leave the wine. And you may actually end up with a clearer wine in the long run. And so the Chardonnay you've got in front of you uh, was uh, hyperoxed. So this is an example of what that looks like uh, in action. So just uh, the idea here is we put an oxygen stone in the juice and just started bubbling oxygen, straight oxygen until it turned brown. And it was really terrifying to do uh, the first time I did it. But um, I think the results kind of speak for themselves. Yeah, and then boom, coffee. Hey. So... Uh, the advantages to this, it's easy. Uh, you can potentially minimize phenolics. Limited additives, you're not even adding SO2 at, up front. You don't even add it until the tank. So you let the wine get to uh, the tank. You don't have to hyperoxy juice. That's just another step. That's just one thing you can do. You don't have to do that. Um, uh, and then you can also make a wine more ageable. So because you're going to take anything that might oxidize in the bottle, you're going to oxidize it up front in the juice stage. It's going to fall out. And then any of these other things like glutathione and other uh, things that can bring, uh, come back to bite you in terms of, of reduction in the end because they're really powerful antioxidant, those things are going to get out of there. So um, if you want a wine that you're going to build to age, um, you, you want to go ahead and, and look at using oxidative processing. You know, Chablis would be a great example of this. They aren't doing a whole lot of uh, super reductive uh, style of processing on, on those types of wines. The downside is um, you're going to lose some potential aromatic compounds. That's the, the trade-off. You're going to lose those short-term, really pretty thiols that would come around and make a wine beautiful like the Sauvignon Blanc is right this minute. So you, you won't get that really pure fruit expression. All right, so go ahead and try wine two. Um, this is your Chardonnay. So this is limited clarification. I mean, we just pressed it to tank. We added no pectinase, nothing. We put it in a tank. And we hyperoxed it till it turned brown. Uh, we let it sit kind of chilled overnight and then racked it to uh, 500 liters Sanso uh, punchins uh, for fermentation. And uh, this was really low yan coming in. So we had a lot of challenges uh, getting through it, but we definitely uh, added quite a bit of nitrogen to it to get it through. So we added right to the legal limit, one gram per liter of DAP to get it walked through. The yeast was uh, CY 3079, which is just like the, the Chardonnay that we have currently. And uh, it's full mallow. And uh, this was uh, barrel fermented. And uh, we let it get fairly warm during the fermentation because we're trying to build mouthfeel at this point in time. So the way we're building mouthfeel is through a lot of things. So when you smell this wine, you're not going to taste that initial beautiful fruit. You aren't going to get that big punch of passion fruit and guava but instead you get all these secondary aromas. So you've got a little bit of butter and 
from the, the ML. You've got a little bit of vanilla and bacon from the oak. And then you've got toast and dough from the lees stirring. So you're just building a lot more complexity into the wine. And so this wine is also engineered, but it's engineered using uh, things a little bit more from just simply nature, uh, where we're just taking what's already there uh, from the fruit, and then we're going to go ahead and ferment that, and we're going to have a result thanks to the barrel additive. So this is a really good example of secondary characteristics. There are really no primary aromas left. There are no ferment esters left, you know, three years down the road in bottle. Um, what you're looking at is now a wine that's maturing. But realize that if you were to taste the 2017 Sauvignon Blanc right now, you'd probably be like, ew, canned corn, gross. This wine's just coming into its own. So the idea here is when you hyperox something, you're going to be able to build a wine to haul. So if you want to do something that's going to last a long time in bottle, you've got to get those compounds out of the way. So you're trying to make ageable whites. A little bit of oxidation in the juice stage is fantastic. Remember, juice stage only. Once we get to fermentation, oxygen off. This is only in the juice stage. All right, so let's wrap up oxidative versus reductive processing. From a chemistry standpoint, I think this is really awesome. So here you have two wines in front of you that are, for all intents and purposes, identical. 100%, I mean, with the exception of volatile acidity, 100% identical. We have you know, very similar uh, sulfur dioxide numbers. We have very similar pHs. We have very similar alcohols. And I think this is why I, I tended towards using these two wines, is you can just see how using your varietal and deciding what it's going to be and what processing technique you're going to use, how you can really drive wines into totally different styles. Now, obviously, we couldn't turn the Sauvignon Blanc into Chardonnay. We couldn't turn Chardonnay into Sauvignon Blanc. But if you wanted to make a, a more Sancerre style, ageable white, you could hyperox a Sauv Blanc. You could just go for the pyrazines. You could ferment it in some older oak. And then you could let that wine bottle age for a couple of years and just get that sort of peppery, leasy uh, characteristic that you can get in an aged Sancerre. So that's a stylistic choice that you can make. Um, so, so consider that when you're uh, making your wine. Where do you want your wine to be? Are you looking for a flash in the pan, doing canned wines, doing fresh, vibrant things that people are going to take off the shelf and drink tonight? Then reductive processing might be exactly what you need to get that real pop of floral and fresh aromas from something like a Sauvignon Blanc. But on a Chardonnay, if you're trying to make a serious wine that critics are going to get into, they're going to try and, and, and a few years down the road, and, and get a little bit more serious about the wine, using some oxygen on the front end can uh, help to, to, to make these things happen. But also realize, one last thing I want to talk on problem solving, you probably wouldn't want to hyperox or use a whole lot of oxidative processing if you have highly moldy or rotten fruit, because then you're just going to add fuel to an already uh, extreme fire. So when you're working with compromised fruit, um, really, really think uh, in terms of how you might solve those problems uh, you know, through use of sulfur dioxide and other things. So sometimes in a bad year, some of your, your dreams and goals go out the window. Um, but I wanna talk about uh, how we might solve some of those problems uh, through using flotation uh, in moldy and musty fruit. But pretty cool, I think this is a really great example. Okay, let's talk about oxygen usage during flotation. You guys have heard me talk about flotation. Um, the idea here is you've got a pump, you've got compressed cast, you've got a diffusion stone, some sort of an expansion chamber, and you're uh, basically pumping a plume of uh, nitrogen into a container, and it's taking all the stuff and floating it to the top. The mechanics you need are a pump, uh, some sort of compressed gas, a diffusion stone, and an expansion chamber. And in this case, you can see really easily uh, how we did that. And then you note on the front of the pump, there's a little sample valve, and that's where we were pulling to check our turbidities as we moved along. So finding in the juice phase, there's a lot of ways you can do this, um, but this is a really, really, really good way to fix up wines that have problems. Um, or not problems, but um, I am absolutely sold on, on flotation. Uh, so basically what we do is we take pressed juice, we generally add some pectinase to the wine, and that pectinase uh, thins the juice down a little bit, just like we want. And then the key ingredient here is usually gelatin. Now, gelatin comes in not only 
you know, bone based uh, animal proteins, but there are also um, uh, vegetable uh, gelatins out there. And what you guys are tasting today uh, with the, the, the Rieslings and the Sauvignon Blanc were done with um, uh, some, some combination of regular and veggie jellies, gelatins. So um, uh, they're not uh, perfectly vegan, but you can go that way if you want to. Um, I'm sure there's none left in the wine now because it's been sterile filtered and that's gone. But there's some other things you can add is PVPP, carbon, bentonite. So what you can do is look at your wine and we talk about problem solving. You bring in some really moldy, nasty fruit. This is the best thing of all because you press it, you treat it immediately with whatever you need to treat it with. And all of these fining agents such as carbon, bentonite, gelatin, they can grab on to things like lackeys, which will destroy your wine, uh, which is just an enzyme. You can grab it and you can pull it out. You can float immediately out any nasty, uh, you know, natural yeast, um, anything that might take your wine on a, a, a bad run, a lactobacillus cunchii that will rip it through mallow and a heartbeat before you even start fermenting. Um, a lot of really nasty bugs can be remediated quickly. So you get this into tank. You float it, and then you immediately uh, can start fermenting pretty quick. So uh, some additions here, uh, finding agents, uh, gelatin I think is key, but I've heard people floating with just PVPP or carbon or bentonite. Um, there's a variety of different things out there. Consult different manufacturers. Uh, I'm learning in this, so don't uh, take me as an authority, but this is what it looks like, and this is the raft that you create on top, uh, kind of like making a consomme. You uh, break the juice and get it to all the junk to float to the top. So here's some visuals. Uh, this is the, the Rieslings that you have in front of you. And this was uh, as we uh, did the flotation process. So the press juice is on the left. And then after 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes, and then 90 minutes, this is uh, how much junk we got out of the, uh, the, the wine. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then uh, if you look at the slide on the right, uh, this is the nitrogen versus oxygen and that idea of hyperoxying a juice. Um, and you can see how that juice really browned. Now, I want you to take a look in your glass uh, that you've poured these two wines and look at them in the glass and tell me if the color's all that different. And I think it's really fascinating that they look really, really similar and that all those tannins that showed up uh, precipitated and aggregated. We'll talk about uh, what those numbers actually are here in a minute. So... Here's the advantages and disadvantages, and this is what it comes down to. The upside of flotation, it's done at room temp, no heating or cooling required. When you look at the energy costs of chilling a tank down, it is tremendous. Refrigeration is very, very expensive. We're in Washington state where energy is pretty cheap, but in other states where it's expensive, it could literally cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars to chill down one tank of wine, one small tank. In a big winery, it's it's many thousands of dollars. So the idea of being able to you know get rid of that power requirement is pretty substantial. Again, that upside is you can fix problems. You can remediate mold, rot, and other phenolic grip issues, uh, i.e. the Sauv Blanc, which is usually really grippy and we have to throw a ton of sugar at to cover up all the tannin. We floated all that out this year. It's really cool. Um, and... Then the other thing is it saves time. You know, you're looking at about two hours to float a tank. And in some cases, uh, big wineries have continuous floats where they basically pump the juice in one side and it goes through basically a big trough. And as the uh, juice flows through, it clarifies and comes out clean the other side. And then there's a, the, the, the raft goes to the top and there's a vacuum cleaner that sucks the raft off continuously and they can continuously flow juice through and continuously float the juice and immediately go from press right through the float machine to a tank and to ferment. And why that's important is that saves a whole tank rotation. So in big wineries, your money is in turning tanks. And if you can cut out having to fill a tank, chill it, settle it for 24, 48 hours, and then rack it and clean it, the, the energy and labor savings are tremendous. So not only are you saving uh, in the continuous floats, not only are you saving uh, you know, energy, you're saving a whole tank cleaning. And when you think about the labor that goes into that and the water inputs and the cost, it is just massive. And then also, if you do this properly, you'll end up with greater juice yields than you will with just settling. 
The downside is it's eight o'clock at night and you just finished pressing and you still have three hours to float because you got two hours to float it. You got to rack it to whatever you're going to rack it to, inoculate it, and then you got to clean a tank. So moderate uh, uh, product to use. So you're going to be using some more stuff. Um, you know, obviously do a cost benefit analysis, whether that balances out the energy savings, but some of these, uh, you know, vegetable gelatins are getting fairly affordable. Um, so not a terrible idea. And, and also look outside of the enological product world. There's a lot of uh, vegetable gelatins just available in general. So I know some bigger wineries that just experiment with some of the, the broader market stuff, uh, where they can buy 50 pound bags of it, uh, for, for a, a lot less money than, you know, buying a specific enological one. Um, and then, uh, you know, if using a gelatin is an issue for you. Um, you know, there are vegans, uh, gelatins available. So I want to point that out. Okay. So let's talk about the 2019 Sage Bar Riesling. We went ahead and axial fed this through the press. And, uh, what we did after that is just press the guts out of it. So we distemmed it, smashed it in the press, pressed the guts out of it. Um, you know, put two tons in a one ton press and then, uh, pressed it to tank. And then we took that tank and split it. So we pumped it into one of our bigger tanks and then split it into two smaller tanks. And then after we split it to the two smaller tanks, they're exactly the same. So we did the nitrogen flotation first because we wanted to do it quickly before any oxidation would start to happen. And these are the things that we added, Sinfree enzyme. We added a little bit of Divergent F and then we added um, some gel called Supra. And uh, which is a, a gelatin from before. Uh, the PVPP Divergent F is from BSG and Sinfree is from Scott Labs. So equal opportunity uh, flotation. Um, and then it took about 90 minutes to get to uh, 50 NTUs. And then the oxygen flotation, exactly the same as. Everything is exactly the same. The only difference is, is that uh, we used pure oxygen uh, to, to go ahead and, and, and um, perform the operation. So the only difference is, is the uh, inert gas. Both wines were processed uh, on 920. Um, we ran it with VIN 13 yeast. The yams were stupid low as they always are from, from Sagemore on the Riesling. Uh, and we knew it uh, was initially right off the bat, the nitrogen ferment really got stinky quick. The oxygen smelled pretty good. But one of the things that was pretty interesting was, is we watched the oxygen ferment, uh, even though the nitrogen ferment started out of the hole a little bit quicker, um, it took about 11 days longer for the nitrogen fermentation to complete. When we think about uh, what yeast go through when you inoculate, they've got to go into an environment and build up cholesterol and agosterol and all these uh, fatty acids to build up their cell membrane. And they do that primarily from oxygen. Oxygen is their, their substrate to help build these fatty acids. They grab things out of the juice and oxygen is what they take in to build up their, their cell membranes. So, um, Again, just showing that idea that when there's a little bit of oxygen in the juice, uh, it's a much more uh, beneficial fermentation environment. However, I'd like to point out both of these ended up a bit reduced at the end. Um, so let's talk about some phenolics. So we did some uh, pre-float versus post-float, and we pulled them from the individual tanks. And um, I think this is really telling. So we had, uh, again, tiny amounts of tannin compared to what we talk about red wine. We're talking four or five, 600, but we had about 35, uh, you know, milligrams a liter of tannin in both of the juices. And then by the time we finished um, with them, uh, we had significant tannin reduction, you know, uh, nearly, you know, 25% uh, tannin reduction in, in both of them. And I think we can see that kind of place where the, the, the nitrogen, um, you know, didn't, wasn't as effective at tannin removal. I think the oxygen, we definitely see a difference where there was a reduction in tannin, probably from aggregation and precipitation. And then we look at catechin, and this is where there's a huge difference, where we see these small, highly reactive phenolics uh, just literally oxidizing and falling out of the wine. So catechin just way down, uh, but again, tiny amounts. I mean, I don't know if these would even be a perception, but uh, definitely when we look at the measurement and empirical data, they are different. So um, the juice definitely showed that. Does that carry through to the wine? We'll have to see. So quick notations. We missed the last DAP ad on this wine. This wine got stinky. Garlic, onion, stinky. Um, it smelled almost like vomit, to be honest with you. Uh, it was really uh, unpleasant. And um, I was taken aback a bit. And we tried a copper edition. It didn't work. Um, so the, the group and I, we worked on this for a bit. 
And I think, you know, Emilio really pushed it. Um, and so did Lindsay. I remember Emilio and Lindsay really pushing me on this. Um, but to um, uh, make sure that we, we got this fixed up. So we did do an ascorbic acid add. And then we had to follow it with a little bit of copper sulfate uh, on the wine. So here's the chemistry that's in front of you. This is the actual wine that's in, in your glass right now. This is the pre-sweetened. So as we were filtering, I took these bottles off. This does not have any residual sugar in it. This is what uh, Sage More Riesling would taste like dry. But one of the things I really find fascinating is both of these wines, whenever we do Sage More Riesling, um, when it's the dry form, it is uh, really grippy. No matter how we process it, it has a lot of you know grip to it. And I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, it's grown in a very hot location and it's Washington. So we're going to build quite a bit of tannin compared to other cooler uh, locations such as Germany. So we had quite a bit of tannin in this wine. And these don't taste like that. It's quite a bit of acid, but I don't get that grip that I used to get out of them. So um, we're looking at a dry Riesling at about 13 and a half percent alcohol. Uh, and pretty pretty solid acidity, uh, definitely quite vibrant. Uh, tastes a lot more uh, vibrant than the six and a half grams it is. But here's what I think is really cool. So on the left side, we have tannin, and tannin can continue to precipitate in both wines, but again, the oxygen just less. And then we get to catechin, um, virtually none in either of them. So uh, almost just a measurement difference. Uh, so whether or not this you know is hugely meaningful that we used oxygen or not, it definitely altered the aromatic profile. And so I uh, look forward to hearing what you guys think of it. I don't want to put words in your mouth or smells in your nose, as the case may be. Um, but we see uh, a definite difference in, in structural components. So what would happen to these wines long run? Well, the oxygen one probably would start to develop um, more nose in the long run, whereas the nitrogen one probably is going to go more towards that canned aroma in the, in the long run. So... Um, you know, the jury would have to be out. We'll have to look at them in a few years and see if it, it changed anything. So conclusions on flotation. Uh, this is really useful in reducing phenolic material up front. It's also re useful in re resolving problems. It's useful in saving energy. Um, it's useful across the board. Um, I really like it. I think it's something that I can see why the industry is uh, latched onto it. Um, definitely something we'll be working on more in the future. Um, oxygen also might be uh, useful in conversion to certain phenolics, and it definitely has an effect on the mouthfeel and aroma. Is that good or bad? I look forward to hearing from you uh, about that. So maybe we'll talk about that during the Rosé Masterclass. Um, and overall, it's just another tool to make great wine, um, something that has definitely been eye-opening to me, you know, my 30 years in the wine industry, first year I've ever used it. And, um, you know, absolutely something I think is, is uh, really, really warranted. Um, just another great tool to make great wine. And uh, that's all. Uh, and uh, we'll go ahead and follow up on uh, red wine uh, and using oxygen management in uh, reds next.